Today, I'm travelling to Footscray in Melbourne's Inner West. It's a beaut place to live close to the CBD. And while garden space in the city can be limited, this plot shows that it is no limit to productivity. So we don't have that big a backyard and I, I really have an interest in different types of plants, so I've just had to find space for everything. David Elliott works as a youth mental health nurse, but he's out in the garden every chance he gets. We've got really good northern exposure here, but we also have a lot of trees along the fence line which protect it. So if that's a perfect little microclimate, what's it allowing you to grow? Oh, well, a lot of different things that you wouldn't normally find in people's backyards. And I want to grow a lot of edibles, and preferably ones that I can't find at the local supermarket. A good example is just over here. We've got a tree called a wampi. I love that uh, name. Yeah, wampi. it's a great name. <laughs> and it kind of grows anywhere citrus will grow. With a few other considerations, it really doesn't like frost, mm. and it needs very good drainage. Mm. Because this doesn't have a cross-pollinator, it's seedless. Um, it's sort of reminiscent of citrus, but it's, it's got its own flavour. Very sweet, juicy and tangy all at the same time. Really nice fruit. It's incredible to see how much David has packed into his backyard and how productive it is. I've got probably about 50 different types of fruit trees. Wow. Um, these are really interesting. Collectively, they're what we call mountain papayas, and they all come from the highlands of South America. They grow in sort of temperate subtropical climates. They do quite well in Melbourne. Um, two of the species need cross-pollination, but this one sets fruit without a male oh, and female it, tree. Yes. It's Beautiful. called a babaco yeah. and quite a nice fruit to eat. And I like the pomegranate here and yeah, locusts yeah. here. Got everything. And then we've got a mulberry just to the right here, yeah. which is starting to fruit quite nicely. And what's this one? Well, this is uh, another relative of citrus. It's called a white sapote, and it comes from the highlands of Central America, so pretty easy to grow in Melbourne. I've got two cultivars because I thought I needed cross-pollination, but it turns out that they're self-pollinating and they're basically ever-bearing. So I'm going to have fruit pretty much all year round. Wow. Because you can see there's fruit kind of ripening now, and yeah. then I've got some more flowers setting, and this tree, the same thing. On a semi-mature tree, you can get five, six, seven hundred fruit on the tree. Wow. So really, really productive. It's another great way to save space, grow a few dwarf varieties. Yeah, that's right. I've got a couple of citrus here. There's mm. a tangelo, which has a wonderful fruit. That's so sweet. Oh, I love Oh, they're beautiful yeah. things, yeah. And a blood orange. Not enough people grow a blood orange. No, I like they're them. lovely. That's another good space-saving idea with the grapes. Yeah, growing it on a vertical space mm. saves uh, room for other plants. That particular grape is an American species called Vitis rotundifolia, and I've got other American species, Vitis labrusca. They're much better suited to coastal climates which tend to be more humid. The European varieties succumb to fungal diseases. These don't. You don't have ah. to spray them. And not only that, they're much, much more flavoursome. Mm. Uh, I've got one, for example, that tastes pretty much just like passion fruit. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Now, nice espalier, another good way of saving space. Yeah, so this is a, an apple tree. It's a Granny Smith uh, that I've grafted six buds on from other varieties. Mm -hmm. Um, three of them came from a friend who inherited this little orchard in a front yard. And I've also got a pink lady, a Jonathan, a hue and crab. So not only will I um, improve pollination, but also it'll spread um, the harvest of the apples probably from kind of January through to April or May. amazing. Now, as you know, mm. I've been here some years ago. Mm. Your house and garden was owned by a lady called Hazel Jones. Mm, yeah. And she showed me her fernery and she was always worried when she sold what was going to happen to it. Was it going to change? Well, you haven't changed it one little iota. Well, some of the ferns are still here, actually. Mm. Uh, mm. We've added some more plants, of course, but yeah, yeah the, some of the plants are still here. And you've got lots of pots. 
Well, they uh, came out of my desire to collect orchids. I started collecting orchids, and they come in little black plastic pots, which I absolutely abhor. So I made all the pots, starting with a you know, ball of wet clay. Uh, I either pinch the forms out of the wet clay, or I press them into a plaster mold if I want to make the same form over and over again. Uh, once that form dries, I bisque fire them to a low temperature. Uh, and then we'll apply uh, a matte glaze or maybe a slip and then refire it at a higher temperature so they're nice and strong and vitreous. And you use the pots to save space again? Uh, yeah, so I've sort of cascaded them down from one central pot so I can get several layers. They all get good light exposure and good air movement, so it's an ideal environment for orchids. Hanging gardens of Babylon. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> a foot screen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. David gets a lot of food out of his garden and something even more important. I love coming home from work, which can be a bit stressful, and coming out here and it completely shifts my focus onto something else, something living, and uh, I just really enjoy that. It really helps me unwind. <laughs>